Okay. Hello, everybody. This is, uh, I'm Joan Hawkins. I'm the chair of the Writers Guild of Bloomington, and I'm the co-coordinator with Tony Brewer of the first Wednesday uh, spoken word series that's a regular event sponsored by the Writers Guild. We're also sponsored in part by the Indiana Arts Commission, the Bloomington Arts Commission, and the Bloomington Urban Enterprise Association. So we're both doing this on Zoom, and we're also streaming live on Facebook. If you're on Zoom, um, it'll help us if you uh, mute your microphone and um, mute out your video so that we have as much bandwidth as we can have. And uh, performers will be spotlighted as they come up. We invite you to comment on chat if you're on um, if you're on Zoom, and if not, you can leave us likes, and I think you can leave us comments also on Facebook. And we're always happy to get some love from our listeners. Okay, so to begin, uh, the Writers Guild of Bloomington wishes to acknowledge and honor the indigenous communities native to this region and recognize that Indiana University and the city of Bloomington were built on indigenous homelands and resources. We recognize the Miami, Delaware, Potawatomi, and Shawnee people as past, present, and future caretakers of this land. We have uh, an ongoing series. So most of our series go dark during the summer. The first Sunday, um, First Wednesday, Spoken Word will continue throughout the summer. And Third Sunday, Write, which has become a virtual, a virtual series on Facebook, will continue. So as the library remains closed for the summer, we'll continue to hold Third Sunday Write virtually. Uh, we have once a month prompts, and we've moved from, uh, from Google Docs to Facebook because a number of folks were having problems navigating Google Docs. Mm. So prompts will be sent to you by the third Friday of the month, and you can share a piece with the group via our new private Facebook page. If you're interested in joining Third Sunday Write, the virtual edition, you can contact Shauna Ritter, and her email is shauna, S-H-A-N-A, 747 at gmail.com. And I would encourage you all to go to the writersguild.com um, website and sign up for the newsletter and you'll get uh, notices of events that are coming up. So tonight we have um, some wonderful people. We have Ortet providing music. We have uh, Jennifer Payne, Jeffrey Bean, and Eric Fuhrer as our readers this evening. And I'll be introducing each person or each group. Website and sign up for the newsletter and you'll get notices. Sorry. It's one of the problems with monitoring Facebook. You get this, um, you get feedback. Um, I, uh, um, yes, yeah, so I'll be introducing each performer before he or she comes on. And the running order roughly will be, um, Ortet will play for about five minutes, then uh, Jennifer Payne, then Jeff Bean, and then Eric, each for seven minutes. Then Ortet will play a longer set um, accompanying a film for about 15 minutes. Then we'll have another uh, round of seven minute readings by this time Jeff Bean, Eric Fuhrer, and Jen Payne. And then we'll end with a lightning round with Eric, Jen, and Jeff each reading a poem and Ortet will end the evening. So to introduce my friends from Ortet, which is a, one of my favorite groups in Bloomington, they're a projection of urban deer reclamation cult, and they combine spoken word and ambient field recordings with an improvisational sound bed, exploring the edges of music, culture, and location. They're based in Bloomington, um, and they have a, a kind of ever-changing group of people that join them. Marty Belcher plays all saxes. Tony Brewer does phone foley. Uh, Norbert Herbert does um, uh, effects. Chris Rawl does turntables and sax. Joe M.F. Stone does drums and mixage. Joining us from Tacoma, Washington, Michael Rings on box, etc. Uh, the most recent release by most of this ensemble was a disc called Paris Suite that was in, uh, released in 2017. And there's more information at www.urban deer. Dot com, or you can find them on Facebook. So please join me in welcoming Ortet.
Thank you. Um, so we will be having more TED again um, a little bit later in the program. So our first reader is Jennifer Payne. She's a multidisciplinary artist from Bloomington, Indiana. She studied creative writing at Indiana University and represented IU in the College Union's Poetry Slam Invitational in 2017. 
She's participated in her local slam community for four years. Jennifer also makes wire wrapped jewelry and operates a small local handmade style shop. So Jennifer. Hi. Hi. My name is Jennifer and I'm an alcoholic. My mother was an alcoholic and her father before her. We may have been genetically predisposed. The numbers go something like half alcoholics are. We were also three or four times more likely to try surviving in this way because one of our parents did. One parent is all it takes to change the way a child copes. The tropes have been written from so many angles. Mine, a mother who couldn't show her love. Hers, at the landfill, three daughters dangled by drunk daddy over the dumps, steep downward edges, front wheel drive, the rear tires need not have traction. My grandfather threatened to let them meet their death in the depths, while my mother and her sisters screamed in the back seat, sending trauma to the depths of their bodies, not one of them managed to purge. Add to that the unwanted touches from two drunken uncles, and those girls, every one of them, grew up to numb it used an alcohol solvent to send back to the depths the pain not one of them ever felt safe enough to let go of. They remained broken and raised another generation that way. Today, one quarter of parents charged in child abuse and neglect cases admit the use of alcohol during the course of their crimes. Rapists claim its effect at the slightly higher rate of one third, and I wonder if my patriarchy ever owned their guilt. I ponder the damage drunk dead men on the generation of women before me and I weep. Enraged, my mother beaten and raped became a statistic poster. A child, I did not discern her indifference or that the difference between us wasn't healthy. I'd abide her remarks that I was fucking pathetic or the violence and the way she flipped my sister over the couch as a power trip. Didn't use the word abuse till I was in my 30s, after my second son was born. I want to mourn the mother I could have had. Enough sense into the men that broke her, but my only course of action requires moving forward. The only people I can save share my blood and my name. But as of today, they will not share the fate of a drunken mother. I refuse to accept the curse generational. I will disrupt the path alcoholism would have taken to my son. Hi, my name's Jen. I'm 18 months sober and I'm an alcoholic. Uh, I'm usually rainbows and butterflies, happy, positive side of things. Uh, my poetry gives me a place to talk about the things that have hurt, the things that are dark, the things that are scary, um, my diagnoses how they are or are not treated. Um, I've got a lot of medical trauma and some of how I managed to stay relatively unmedicated is through this work. Um, so I hope you'll <clears throat> uh, ride with me through some of the darker stuff here and, and uh, maybe even be able to enjoy it, relate to some of the harder things that have happened. Um, Cause they have brought beauty. They, we wouldn't have light without the dark. We wouldn't be able to see how good it is if we'd never been hurt. Right, let me get a drink. My mother tells of bridges. Pacing on a sun bleached wooden plank, innocence in chains. Freshly freed of security, fear eats my belief that someone loves me. Forced from car to dust covered ground, I hear that rushing water sound. My father's drunken yelling drowns out my little labored footfalls. If I delay, he will abandon me here in my fear of drowning or falling or what he will do to my sisters if I don't step over the crack. My heart falls through, staining the white river with the tears of my youth at six. I believe this is why I exist. This is what love is. Doing hard things because someone who says they love me says I should. 
at 15 rate. Take cock of school football star as he says he will love me forever until distended abdomen tells the secret of how well I washed at his request. How he threw me away after one day. How pastor would say, Jesus loves me one week and kick me out of the back row seat next week when my swelling belly made his parishioners shiver at the possibility that Jesus isn't everywhere or I must have wanted it to begin. They say I was baiting him, pacing in waves like the worm on his hook. Why else stand alone at the edge of the bridge? and make not one move to cross it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, it's always very courageous when people share like that. Uh, our next poet is Jeffrey Bean, who was uh, let's see, who was raised in Bloomington. He holds a Bachelor of Music degree in jazz guitar performance from the Oberlin Conservatory of Music and an MFA in creative writing and poetry from the University of Alabama. From 2006 to 2008, he served as the Axton Fellow in Poetry at the University of Louisville. Currently, he lives with his wife, Jessica, and daughter, Olivia, in Mount Pleasant, Michigan, where he is professor of English and creative writing at Central Michigan University. His first full-length collection, Diminished Fifth, was published by David Robert Books in 2009, and his chapbook, Girl Reading, A Letter at an Open Window, won the 2013 Vern Cowles Copper Dome, Copper Dome Poetry Chapbook Prize and was published by Southeast Missouri State University Press. His chapbook, the Voyeur's Litany won the Anabiosis Press Chapel Contest and was published in 2016. His second full-length collection, Woman Putting on Pearls, won the 2016 Red Mountain Poetry Prize and was published by Red Mountain Press. His poems have been featured on the NPR program, The Writer's Almanac, and in Garrison Keillor's anthology, Good Poems, American Places. Recent poems appear in the journals Field, Slate.com, Southern Poetry Review, The Missouri Review, Crab Orchard Review, Subtropics, Smartish Pace, and River Sticks, among others. Information about his publications can be found at www.jeffreybean, -E all one word, Jeffrey Bean Poet. So J-E-F-F-R-E-Y-B-E-A-N Poet all one word, dot com. So Jeff, do you want to take it away? Yeah, thanks so much, Joan. Uh, and thanks, Jennifer, for that really powerful reading. Um, uh, it's a real honor for me to be invited to this reading. I'm uh, a Bloomington native. That's my hometown. So big thanks to the Writers Guild at Bloomington for inviting me. A uh, special shout out to Kyle Quass, my old good friend, one of my favorite musicians ever. Also, I have to give a shout out to Norbert Herber, who's in Quartet. Thanks for that awesome music. It's great to hear Norbert make some, some music along with the others. Uh, Norbert and I used to hang out a little bit in the 90s. So good to hear your stuff again, Norbert. Um, so thanks again for having me, everybody. So this first poem I'm going to read is uh, from uh, my first book, Diminished Fifth. Uh, so it's kind of an old poem. Um, it's called Why I Failed at Baseball. And I did fail at baseball. I sucked at baseball. I was a little kid in Bloomington sucking at baseball. So this is a poem about that. Why I failed at baseball. I feared the shirtless bodies at practice, reckless, unleashed. The boys muscled ribs, scorpion fierce. I couldn't learn to charge through the wind at them. I liked only baseballs fresh from packages. I hated the dirt hardened game balls I never took home, their bone and tendon color. I hated the daily failings of my milk weak hands. I lived in the outfield, far from the shouts and violent dust, lost in the odor of grass, the gum and crushed popcorn potpourri wafting from beneath the bleachers. The mitt smell better than horses. I dropped everything. 
I couldn't keep my eyes off mayflies fucking overhead, slamming into lights all their single day. All season at the plate, I whisper cursed the vicious pill of the ball. Come at me. Come on, you fucker, son of a bitch. The coach said, you've got to hate it to hit it. I tried to hate it hard. You damn ass thing. I was just learning to swear. Bash me, burst me open. Yes, I could hate it. I did hate it. And I hated the pink breakable fruit of my body. Okay, so I wanted to read uh, just a couple short ones from uh, my newer book, Woman Putting on Pearls, which was just out a couple of years ago. Um, and I thought it was fitting to read this poem, uh, which is called I Come from Indiana. I wish we were all together at Bear's Place tonight, face to face, uh, but this is the next best thing. I come from Indiana, where the only thing to eat is clouds. I was born in a snowstorm, the blizzard of 78. And like snow, I come back every year, shaking my hair, dancing to the slowest music full of whole notes. I come from Indiana, where the shoulders of the ground grow hairy with grasses, where anthills swell up into heat and the smell of tar shimmering over roofs. I walk out wearing nothing but a huge coat of corn. I vanish into the horizon, but never leave like a line of highway traffic. I throw handfuls of myself into air. The particles of me gather below streetlights like mayflies, die in the afternoon, then gather again, night after night. I come from Indiana, where faces grow plump in dreams like lettuce and soil and good men in towns pour oil into mowers a few feet from wild deer sniffing the wind hidden behind trees. I come from Indiana where all the stories about me are true. The day I stole that policeman's horse, the day I drove my Honda blindfolded into a tornado, the day I spray painted cellar door, cellar door, over and over on my girlfriend's cellar door until her father chased me with a burning log into the woods where he couldn't find me because I was making love to his daughter under a bridge in a thunderstorm. I come from Indiana and when I'm there, I enter the air like a teenager diving from a boat, the hard blade of his torso slicing the lake while his mother out of earshot calls him home. Okay, I'm gonna, this will be the last poem I read for this first set. Um, and I'm just gonna read the poem on the very next page in the book. It's called What Geraniums Smell Like. Uh, and I realized when I wrote this poem, I have a lot of childhood associations with the smell of geraniums. Uh, so that's where this comes from. Uh, only thing to mention, uh, this poem makes mention of service merchandise, which um, some of you might remember as like an old department store like a Kmart that's no longer in business. There used to be one in Bloomington. So that's what service merchandise is. What geraniums smell like? Like birds. Like my brother leaving for the lake. Like the smudge of fireworks on driveways. Like breath trapped in a canteen. Like the word breath. Like mice. Like want like a nickel in a fist, like my brother leaving for the store, like my brother leaving for the war, like a handful of washed hair, like my mom humming Johnny Cash, like a red towel in the wash, like a scrape on a thigh, like a service merchandise, like my dad's violin, like a cloth that cleans guns, like car leather, like a war turned low on a radio, like parents getting used to you gone, like baby, I love you, like you are the only one, like holes in the knees of jeans, like what you weren't supposed to see, like drops of blood on a hardwood floor, 
like my brother leaving for the war, like ice in a glass, like beats, like leaving, like please, like bees. Thanks. We have, for people who are on Zoom, you have little reactions at the bottom of your screen so you can have these um, little hand claps going up. Our, um, so for this first set, Eric Fuhrer will be our next poet. And he's a poet, artist, collaborator, and educator. With his wife, the painter Kimberly, Kimberly Andralowitz, he is co-collaborator of Not Human Enough for the Census by Vegetarian Alcoholic Press, 2019, and In Wish I Take Myself Hostage from Sputin Doival Press, forthcoming in 2020. Eric is the author of three additional poetry collections, all of which leverage poetry, poetic erasure. Every Time You Die from Alien Buddha Press, 2019, which includes art by Marcel Herms, VOS from Yavanika Press 2019, which includes redacted digital collages by the author, and At Root from Alien Buddha Press 2020, which includes digital art also by the author. His work has been a finalist for Sir Vision's inaugural James Tate Chapbook Prize and has been nominated for the Pushcart Prize, Best Microfictions, and Best of the Net. Eric received his MFA from the University of Notre Dame. He's currently an editorial assistant for International Studies in Literature and the Environment, ISLE, and a reader for Pigeonholes. He has taught literature, writing, and rhetoric, and creative writing at the University of Notre Dame, St. John's University, Suffolk County Community College, and the College of New Rochelle. He has also worked at two centers for teaching, Notre Dame's Caneb Center for Teaching and Learning, and the University of Iowa's Center for Graduate St Center for Teaching, where he served as assistant director and regularly consulted with faculty and graduate students on various teaching projects, including teaching philosophies. Eric is available for individual consultations on teaching on request, and more information is available at www.eric-fuhrer.com. And you can tweet him at Eric with a K, Fuhrer, all one word, E-R-I-K-F-U-H-R-E-R. -E so Eric, do you wanna take it away? Eric. Yeah, here I am. Yeah. Thank you, John. I appreciate that. You're actually the first person I've ever known to get to um, pronounce my wife's name and my name correctly. Um, <laughs> so, um, so thank you and thank you to uh, Tony as well. Um, and um, to the previous readers, thank you for your readings. That, um, and I look forward to your readings coming up. Um, so um, Jen, like you, I do use poetry to process trauma. I feel like with me, um, it becomes images and kind of becomes kind of the trauma gets processed out of the poems or into the poems and then they get locked inside. But anyway, um, but I really appreciated the way you were able to, just the bravery of your poems. Um, they're really great. Um, I found you in a peach pit, my teeth. Every time I swallow them, my mind softens like a cheese that I place on the windowsill like a licking salt. My mind tastes the way you used to look at me when I first fisted my body into a bird. Perhaps I was a trapeze artist until I lost all my teeth in that rainstorm. This is all bullshit, you say, as I stir a molar into my tea for extra texture. We were never the Laurel and Hardy of glass blowing. And I was born a tongue in a jar, breathing the salt of my own bath. And now look where I am, flagging my wing against the humid sky of your gassy eye. You who are locked in your own sparrow, crashing into every glass door, swallowing every shard, stepping into the sun. 
So these are all new poems that I wrote while I was um, kind of quarantined. So I'm not sure, still trying to figure out if there's some kind of relationship between that and what's been produced. I'm, I'm not sure. Yellow brick spine. I cut a hole in my back so my spine could ring itself up and out my body. Yes, that glorious centipede slips its weight down the yellow brick, leaving me flapping like a mouth. And you are, pulse, are a pulsing throat, trying to swallow your pill of bees. Well, tell me a story about the hollow-tongued witch who bit blackberries raw in the twilight. Yes, the one who'd pour water over my spine to keep it clean, as a pig when it lipsticked the shoes you were wearing a ruby green. See, a house ain't heavy enough for my new shining bones that will never stop glittering, no matter how much you cry. So please, saddle my spine when you see it. Give it a grand eha and tell it that I am still beautiful and still stand up tall, all on my own. Snail shell safety. My eyelids are the newspapers I read when the light hurts too much to leave the snail shell curling me into the safety of a lover. I have tattooed miracles into my body in hope that if you ever find me, you can Jesus me back into the world like a pig falling over the mountain. Shh. Just a second ago, the bread was falling and you were wearing glass sandals with heels like the devil's backbone. And I was a python waiting for a slice of apple from your holy lips. My body is the scent of your rejection that you towel off with my willow tree hair and you are the opal candle that waxed its way into the shape of my bedazzled mind and I am the disco ball your platform shoes always dreamed of and I am your own private piano and you are fumbling through the next sonata with enough cocaine in your nostrils to keep us awake through this plague. I'll read two more for right now. Former meat. Our water lily faces flood our burlap hearts with enough bees to brittle the yacht of a ship of Vikings. Our ship is a mouth of bruises that we tenderize with baptismal feet straight from the river of our indiscretions. We are the chains, chains of teeth spiking the temples with our blood turned dirt, turned fish in the sunlight in a flop flop pulse. To lick up the egg of dawn is a pocket of pleasure ephemeral in the world egg boiled soft. We are salt scattered from a pillar, shut eye glancing back with a small peak at our former meat quietly sailing off. Floppy knot. You are a shotgun in the mouth of a starfish. Your tongue an onion unfurling in the deep sea. Diving would not bring me closer to you. Not enough oxygen to breathe your primordial goo. Yet you crack my mind like teeth whenever I pray to you. You who are floppy on the floor. You who soup the world without blink, without an eye. I, 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 jack o in my head, feed you what's left. It's mostly you anyway, the way we form a knot. Thank you. Can you all hear me now? Am I unmuted? Okay, so um, Ortet has done a, um, a musical score for a wonderful film by the filmmaker Maya Darren. It's called Witch's Cradle. Maya Darren is, um, she's, she's kind of, she's a special person 
in the history of avant-garde cinema. She was a poet and a dancer. And when her father died, he left her a little bit of money, not lots, but enough so that she could buy a 16 millimeter camera, which was new technology at the time. And she didn't really know a whole lot about um, making films, but she was married to a wonderful Czech filmmaker named Sasha Hamid, Alexander Hamid. And with him, she made one of the most beautiful films of all time, which was Meshes of the Afternoon. And she made that in 1942. In this film that we're going to be seeing tonight, which is Cradle, was made in 43. It's an unfinished, silent, experimental film uh, that was written and directed by Darren and stars Marcel Duchamp, along with some other uh, interesting people. It was filmed in Peggy Guggenheim's Art of the Century Gallery during a surrealist Art of the Century exhibit. And um, the uh, filmmakers co-op listed as a mystical, mystical and spiritual film but it's just marvelous. So welcome, Quartet, and Maya Darren's Witch's Cradle.
Thank you very much for that. Um, so she's one of my favorite filmmakers. She's just fantastic. And if you want to see more stuff by her, most of her short films are up on the web. She did one feature film that she made with Gregory Bateson. They went to Haiti and she was initiated into voodoo in order to be able to film the trance dances that happen when uh, people are, are uh, ridden they say by a god and it's just it's a phenomenal film and she was quite she was quite the amazing woman um so we are coming now into our second round of poets so this round jeff is gonna uh lead off for seven minutes then eric then jen so jeff take it away thanks uh that was awesome ortet and that that film it was totally mesmerizing watching that so that was great and Thanks again to, to Jennifer and Eric for those incredible readings. I feel like I'm kind of still recovering from all of, the, all of that. It was very powerful. Um, so I wanted to return to the newer book and read a couple of poems uh, from a sequence of poems near the end of the book that I call the kid poems. And these are poems where the speaker is a father, is a parent who is addressing his kid. Uh, and I'm a parent, my kid, is watching this downstairs, I think, right now, live on the phone. Um, so this is for her and for all the kids um, and all the parents uh, who are watching. Kid, this is the first rain of November. It strips off the rest of the leaves, reminds trees how to shiver. I think to earth, it looks like the first, first rain the water of the beginning, swirling down hot into gassy soup. The bubbling stuff that imagined trees to begin with, and also mountains, kangaroos, dolphin cartilage, stoplights. And you, tearing down hills on Arnold Street, a blur of training wheels and streamers. And me in the 80s, crunching life cereal on the couch beside my night owl mother, blue in the light of David Letterman's grin. 
Try to remember everything that is solid is not solid, but slowly always melting. The road cracks, wrinkles like a folded map. Huge trees lie down, throb into pulp inside termites. And the ground drinks you, though you grow, a tall drink of water going down easy. It swallows me faster and faster. But don't worry, look at our neighbor's roof. Those fake gray shingles are crumbling, growing a thick pelt of moss. Eventually, we all wake up as forest. Here's another kid poem. Kid, this is October. You can make the maples blaze just by stopping to look. You can set your clock to the barks of geese. Somewhere, the grandfathers who own this town lean down to iron crisp blue shirts, their faces bathing in steam, and blackbirds clamor in packs, make plans behind corn. You know this. You were born whistling at crackling stars. You snap your fingers and big turtles slide out of rivers to answer. You can swim one more time in the puddle of sun in your water glass. Taste icicles already in the white crunch of your lunch apple. Go to sleep. I'll put on my silver suit and chase the sky into the moon. Okay, so I wanted to read um, uh, a newer poem. Uh, this is uh, a poem from a sequence of poems that I've been working on for the last couple of years called um, the Ella poems. Uh, that's what I call them. They're all focused on the point of view of a kid, this young girl named Ella, who's 11 or 12. And it's been a, a really interesting um, uh, way to kind of re-inhabit the childhood imagination and to kind of get inside the mind of a, of a kid again. Uh, and that's something I've been really interested in my work uh, in the last couple of, of years. Um, so these are kind of an extension of the, of the kid poems. Uh, this one's called Ella's Whispers, and it's a fun one to read because I get to whisper. Uh, as I wrote the poem, I heard every other line uh, as a whisper. So I read it that way. And hopefully you'll be able to hear it out there on the internet. Um, if nothing else, maybe you'll get some ASMR tingles or something out of it. And if you don't know what ASMR tingles are, you're probably living your best life, so that's okay. Uh, so this is Ella's Whispers. Ella learned that God's the living word. Don't think, just pray to the Lord. For a year, she watched sunlight, her mother doing wash. Here comes the rain, it sizzle and hush. Ella prays for sap and buzzards, bits of leaf and ash. Ella saw a face last night in the fireplace glass. Oh, holy goes the song, choir blazing in a church. Ella's leg bones lean, longing for a crutch. Preacher holds his thick book, his cloth, Ella's fingers jump and shine with little sparks of math. Cars on the highway, blackbirds in the sky. Ella watches hedges, houses, people waking up inside. Ella, Ella, what's that voice behind the trees? Foxes and doves keep secrets. So do bees. Thanks. Excuse me, we've got, <laughs> this is the first time that we've, uh, we've had this lag with the muting and the unmuting. Um, 
So next up we have Eric and Eric, Eric Fuhrer. Hey, thank you. Um, so these, oh, am I unmuted now? Yeah. yeah, you are. Great, okay. Um, these poems are just from the same set of poems I was reading there, um, what I, I've been calling pandemic poems, but I don't know, I've just written them during the pandemic. So um, anyway, these are new. Loose death. My mouth is a fist you pull onions from on Easter. My body is egg flesh loose between the teeth of a priest who wanders in the grass mazes that spread their dry oceans like meat across our chicken salad and we are the inheritors of ice salt and baked meringue pie during the snowfall in which we shoveled your body into soft flesh like the oysters we guzzled down during the last season when we were all full of your quiet death. Dear Sanctuary, feed me slow pearls from used tongues so my body does not wolf nor sprout into rejection, that childhood fog, a sampling of my body trying to turn itself into a treehouse. Cracked open, I bring you my parade of pills, swallow a swarm of wasps, and you tilt me, you tilt my head to drain me. Safety is a stone caught in my throat, and your plucked eyes are sanctuary, tufts of buzzing lights above us, swallowing the sea. Star Eater. I ring porcelain against my head to feel the scarecrow whittle out my ear and spit straight in my face as if I had finally been brave enough to sink my whole face in. My hair is falling out slowly like closed crow's feet, and I can feel the slow retreat of my body nesting in its split ends, reminding me of the way I used to wish I had a brain tumor. It's a terrible thing to say, I know, but I so desperately wished to escape you. Now paper towels are burning in the toaster, and I feel like this must be what heaven feels like, to be so close to disappearing. Yes, that's dark, but isn't that what Christ did? And he is a galaxy while I am sent to a quiet room with a white pillow and a bracelet that says fall risk. See, we are all as beautiful as our own first stars and you ate mine. So bury me in the tear of my mouth the day you said I didn't listen, and the next day when my body, and you, and the next day, I don't have enough tongues to list them all. Incantation. The nurse asked me to rate my level of depression, and I said, Lucifer, Slipknot, a head of lice. I ate a doorknob and I called it a five. Five is the sexiest number. I take it to bed with me, but all it reminds me of is stairwells and Lucifer, Slipknot, head of lice. So I sleep on the floor as five dissolves into the paint, and I am left my own boogeyman, peeling the shadows from the walls as I wicker my body into a shiver, Lucifer, Slipknot, a head of lice. Today, it's an eight cylinder inside my decaf coffee and my bracelet is beginning to chafe. And I fall into my milk carton because I was missing from the side of it because no one is looking for me except Lucifer Slipknot, head of lice. Block of ghosts. I roll my ghost through the balls of my feet. Doctors said I needed to exercise. That would help with my mood, they say, as my ghosts shoot up my body and through my temples and I termite my way back into the souls of this house that secures me 
like a coffee between the arms of 5 a.m. when I am still awake and I've only clipped two of my nails. And I remember the temperature when they nested me in the wrong acorn. And I remember the way this house dropped its glass eye like a gift. And I remember the time I ran like a seagull, a whole flock of them, until one of them suddenly turned and squawked me back to sleep. Two more lovers. My own devouring. Your throat, a bag of coins, toothed up in a game of roulette that I lapped up and my teeth are flies biting down and you are a foot bath full of birds. The way we speak is a symphony, symphony of cacti, you slurping the sea through a metal straw as I tongue the gaps of sand set loose. The mushroom carrying our cells has been eaten by a river of birds, purging themselves from the sun. As I beak and wing into the boiled earth, I rush my own body like a hand grenade. We are the voices that warm the air into ears waxed shut with laughter, and I am the blood pressure of the sky when it is closing, my eyes devouring their own young. This is the last one. Breakable box. You are a wreck of flowers, a gate swung over your neck like a swan, accusing me of bleeding in the wrong room. And I am a cooked onion, a swollen trip into the arms of a stranger who rides me into town like a lawnmower, and I am the glass eye you swallow when you want to see your liver grow. See, I was always your homegrown garden, a plant that you extinguished your cigarettes in. And when I wanted to play, you broke me like fingernails, scattered them across the highway, and called me your little breakable box. Thank you. So those were fantastic. For all of the poets, I hope that you are checking the chat because you're getting um, really lovely appreciative comments throughout for your imagery and for your stories and, and for being brave enough to share your stories with us. Um, and I just picked up another one that just said, damn, <laughs> which is a great, great comment. Um, for this next, round. So we're going to have Jen next. And then we're going to go into a kind of a lightning round with uh, one poem each. And that'll be Eric, Jen, and Jeff. And I won't be breaking in because it'll be too uh, distracting otherwise. So Jen's going to read for seven minutes. And Eric has a poem. Jen has a poem. And Jeff has a poem. And then we'll close uh, with a final uh, salute from Ortet. So um, and then I'll come back in at the end, Kyle, to make a few comments. But thank you so much for, thank you so much. This has been wonderful. So Jennifer. Hey, everybody. Um, wow, Jeff and Eric, both of you, incredible work. I want to wake up and be a forest someday. And also uh, the fall risk <laughs> got me. You got me on that one. Uh, anyway, so I'm actually gonna start talking about hospitals now. Um, I have two sons. And they both required NICU hospitalization. Um, the first, we were only there for a week. But with Liam, my second son, he was born 13 weeks premature. Um, that's, that's just as you cross into the third trimester. Red shirts are nurses. Gray, respiratory therapists. Dark blue are nurse practitioners. Radiology wears green. If there's no uniform, I'm talking to a doctor, likely either a neonatologist, urologist, nephrologist, or ophthalmologist, though cardiologist, endocrinologist, and geneticist are also possible. Uh, all of this and more often before 9 a.m. And here I am half awake, lactating and waddling on my still swollen ankles because two days in a wheelchair were too many and I will not wait to see my son breathing again. The first person who spoke to me at Liam's bedside told me he had a 40% chance at surviving at best. 
that thought never left my head until long after we left the NICU. I'd been through too much to get him here, to willfully let him slip away. Three hospitalizations, three weeks of bed rest, Epsom salt IVs twice, and an active labor ambulance ride that lasted over an hour. Four days laying in the OBICU waiting, afraid to breathe too hard for the labor to start again. When it did, there was no stopping it. Within one hour, I'd pushed out what two thirds of a pregnancy produced and patiently waited 90 minutes to find out if the gray and silent child that came before the hemorrhage had lived. Minutes after midnight, my son's life outside the womb began to move every boundary I embodied. I thought I had known the limits of my fear, of my faith, of my strength. I believed I had been full, more busy, more tired before. It was phone calls that taught me otherwise. Calls that never came and visitors we never saw taught me that self-care isn't selfish and that self-discipline is the evidence of self-esteem. Midnight calls from the hospital taught me how quickly a heart can stop beating and how much adrenaline it takes to make it start again. To press the green button and answer the phone, do Valentine's Day, born one week before Thanksgiving, two pounds, four ounces, 15 inches at 27 weeks, six days old before we held him in my arms, 90 more before we brought him home. The road between hospital and home was littered with lessons. I learned how to touch such thin skin, pat, don't rub, so as to prevent tearing. It's barely tissue paper. I learned to feed him by guiding a tube through his nasal passages into his stomach and hold the bolts until gravity had done its work. I learned to do sterile dressing changes at bedside without assistance. I learned how to restart a heart smaller than most strawberries. I learned how to be allowed to bring him home. I learned to see scars as science's beauty marks and to see my concept of God as the work of human hands. I learned how to let go of what I believed was mine and help others hold close what was taken from them. Too little, too soon. My son is still trying to live life on his own timeline. He turned seven this last November, <clears throat> born in Prematurity Awareness Month. It's been my education since day one. I'm thankful to be able to be here to witness whatever it is his spirit is in such a hurry to accomplish. Uh, and isn't that the way with children? Don't they teach us that our boundaries are so much bigger than we thought? <laughs> that we can be more than we imagine, that we need to be so that they can. Anyway. Um, I'm just going to tell this story through the phone, but I had my first experience of my own in the hospital um, last year at the beginning of the year. On January 23rd, 2019, at 8.30 a.m., I floated on a rapidly working anti-anxiety bed, wheeled in bed into surgery, just a hysterectomy. I, I had been needing this ungodly bleeding. I'd need, been needing this toxic organ removed for years. Apologies. On January 24th, 2019, at 12.30 p.m., I woke violently, someone telling me that the tube would feel warm and wet as it left my throat. Array of faces, awaiting recognition, comfort, but confusing, pulseless electrical activity. What does that mean? My heart wanted to beat. Internal hemorrhage became an emergency. They shut down the blood bank until they could refill me. Took 14 full units, but not one until the femoral arterial line was established. On the 10th try, they cut down for a central line and both my thighs bore plastic passages that aided in saving my life. For 35 minutes, a dedicated team kept my heart beating. Man. Pressing again through ribs broken in previous compressions, never less than the depth of two inches, lest the effort be wasted and the beating further abate. 
it's been 525 days and I can still barely say that I almost, I'm lucky to be alive. CPR is statistically an end of life event. Only 10% go home. Eight of 10 survive comatose, suffering some level of brain injury. For those resuscitated and not comatose, the consequences of apoxia may include severe memory loss, involuntary muscle contractions, loss of muscle control, loss of mobility, loss of motor control, incontinence, speech impairment, changes in personality, disorientation as to place, person, and time, and yet here am I. Thankful to be with you tonight. Thankful to that CPR team, anesthesiologists who kept me safely asleep. My surgeons, their collective knowledge and skill, everyone who's cared for me while I've been ill, all 42 staples that held my belly closed. Thankful to stand here, presumably home. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jim. Uh, so my final poem uh, is this one. <laughs> Am I muted? Can you hear me? We can hear you. I just had to get you on spotlight. Okay, great. So I'm gonna, uh, yeah, that's gonna be my final poem, obviously. So it's called Stiletto Heel Sermon. We arrived late at the chapel our eyes the color of our heels after walking the world over, searching for the glass slipper that would slide over our toes like communion. The preacher feeds us tarantulas on sourdough, and we remember how it feels to be blessed. So we sequin our tongues to one another and feel the Holy Ghost rush between the warm breath of our intimacy before clasping hands in the chapel's glass eye. The world is sliding its back towards Bethlehem and we are the rough beast and the falcon is the reason we are all still blinking. So the preacher says, let's tap dance to the Lord with our teeth. And everyone flaps their eyes like windows and we all stick our stiletto heels into each other's mouths like guns. Thank you. Monarch butterflies migrate to Mexico. Warm air calls them as autumn sets in elsewhere. Oyamel trees they have never seen seduce them secretly, defying scientific explanation. They have hearkened the arrival of the souls of the dead for generations. Celebrations around, abound, all surrounded by the bright orange patterns flapping. It all seems so happy. Monarchs are poisonous. Though it's not potent enough to kill you, they'll cease the beating of a natural predator's heart with just part of a wing. Quickly, if it swallows the insect whole, they're not palatable, leave a bitter taste in the mouth, and yet always find a way to my stomach. They seem to come with my anxiety, all beautiful, fluttering, turned shuddering, afraid to face what might be. I refuse to finish the application and just get myself insured again. I don't like doctors. That's common enough. Unlike 14 transfused units of blood, successful cardiopulmonary resuscitation in the ongoing problems section of my medical chart and probably ought to be in some therapist's notes, but. I never got that far. <clears throat> I found the blood disorder that caused my first surgical hemorrhage, but not before the discovery of another toxic organ to remove or nodules needing biopsied. Another abdominal surgery, supposedly less complicated. I stayed three days longer, fainted. Well, bedridden without assistance, I hated it. Came home and swore never to go back again. And then my hormones were off. 
fight or flight was high, TS3, TS4, and several more were unbalanced, out of proportion, causing more anxiety, triggering PTSD, hypervigilance hits me, and those butterflies just might be involved. Right, they're related to the one in my throat. The thyroid is a butterfly-shaped gland at the front of the neck, and mine is special. It's been poked, and though the nodules are benign, my thyroid-stimulating hormones are hot. I'm as thin as I've been in my adult life. Hyperthyroidism keeps my heart tachycardic, increases panic, and we're just missing cause, a diagnosis, so we know how to treat me. Took weeks to schedule the MRI. I lost my insurance coverage just days before I would have learned if the monarch in my throat is potent enough to choke on. Thanks, Jennifer and Eric. Those are just awesome poems. I love those last poems. Um, and thanks again to Joan, everybody at the Writers Guild, uh, and to Ortet. This has been an awesome experience. Um, so I'm going to finish with a poem uh, that is kind of a wild one. Uh, it's about my yard, which is a crazy yard, as you'll find out in a minute. This poem is about to come out in the literary magazine, The Laurel Review. I like to give shout outs to lit mags sometimes at readings when I can. So check out The Laurel Review if you haven't already. It's a great one. Uh, this is my yard. My yard is electric salad, sizzling with cricket sparks, smothered in bird shit dressing. My yard rocks Medusa hair, the color of spider blood. My yard is a lazy stoned teenager. It floats in circles around my street on a bicycle, giggling to itself. Each night it plays sloppy bass guitar until the neighbors wake up and call the cops who stomp on its face, dumbfounded in the noise, no one to arrest. My yard doth teach the torches to burn. It changes air into robins, blue jays, squirrels. It breeds helicopter seeds, squeezes pumpkins into fistfuls of white butterflies, hurls them into every kitchen window on my block. My yard can slow dance. It can slam dance. It knows Swahili, English, Aramaic, French, and how to babble like a German baby. My yard is German, baby. It cops a feel from every officer it meets, memorizes their contours, builds sculptures of their asses out of wind. My yard is hot. My yard is blind, and it invented Braille. It has a minor role on a new sitcom called Larry's Place. It drinks its face off every night just to fall asleep. In fact, it is always drunk on worm shit, violets, witchgrass, English daisies, and wild turkey straight bourbon whiskey. My yard peeks into every mailbox. It reads the notes in the pockets of all who pass beside it, but don't call it out because my yard is a big scary motherfucker with a tattoo of a garage opening into another garage and another and so on until it comes to a final garage which holds a diamond with my yard's mother's face on it. Every hawk, rock, pop can and freak is welcome in my yard. Even you, go ahead, lie down, disappear in its fingers. My yard is growing always, even at night when you forget about it, and when it sprouts its wet eyes, it watches you. Thanks. Next up is Ortet. Oh, 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 oh,
cast on. I have decided to cast off all ballast. I have to stop. Sustained 
much of it or what function it serves. We lack a conscientiously developed appreciation of what it means to us. So thank you very much to everybody. Those were wonderful readings, very powerful readings, and um, always fantastic to hear Ortet, which is my favorite musical group in Bloomington. Um, we will be, I posted in the um, chat for, for Zoom and for the uh, Facebook online comments, I posted uh, links to all of the individual pages for the, the writers and also for um, Ortet. And also um, I posted the uh, link to the website for the Writers Guild of Bloomington. You can go there, you can sign up for free and get our newsletter every week. That'll give you an idea of upcoming readings and events. And also we've become kind of a clearinghouse in Bloomington for information about um, resources for artists, especially during this time when things are still closed and we don't have access to venues and people are needing, uh, people are needing help of various kinds. So, um, so that resource is available there. And uh, next month, we will be back here at this site on uh, first Wednesday, which is August 5th. And we'll have two prose readers, uh, Lori Stone from New York and Katie Yoakum from Indiana and uh, Jason Ammerman also from Indiana. He's a wonderful poet. So two prose readers, pride writers and a wonderful poet. And we're still, uh, we're still setting up the music. So I hope to see you virtually um, next month, same time, same place. And once again, a huge thank you to all of you for your work, beautiful, beautiful imagery. This beautiful imagery. Thank you.